After Apple unveiled its iPhone 15 series on September 15th, the world saw a massive pre-order frenzy. However, an unexpected episode unfolded in China. On September 16th, Chinese netizens on Baidu Tieba pointed out a picture on Apple's one-on-one -on -one shopping page that allegedly insulted China. The claim rapidly ignited condemnations against Apple amongst some Chinese individuals. The page featured a person with narrow, wide-apart eyes, a flat nose, facial moles, a Mongolian face, and a Q-like hairstyle, interpreted by these individuals as Apple's attempt to caricature Chinese people. Some users posted, quote, This looks like the typical 19th century Western perception of Chinese, and We've cut off those long braids a century ago. Why are they trying to mock us now? What is Tim Cook's intention? The term, Apple insults China, swiftly trended on Weibo. However, upon further verification, it was found that the featured individual was of indigenous American descent, not Chinese. The same image was also used on Apple's official websites in the US, Japan, Korea, and other countries, meaning it had no connection with insulting China or the Chinese people. Ma Zhu, a commentator based in the US, expressed shock at the immediate allegations against Apple without fact-checking. He conveyed to Radio Free Asia that tagging an image on Apple's website as, quote, insulting to China, reflects a narrow-minded perspective and a significant lack of cultural inclusivity. Netizens also commented, highlighting the hypersensitivity, quote, some are so insecure, feeling that everyone is targeting them. And how fragile do you have to be to make such baseless claims? In a video from September 7, 2013, at a park in Wuhan, female tourists taking photos dressed in Tang Dynasty-style clothing were mistaken by the park staff as wearing Japanese kimono and were asked to leave. Wearing a kimono in public in China can be considered a risky move, as it might invite provocations or even physical confrontations. Such incidents are not rare. In another news report from March 24, 2019, two male students were denied entry to Wuhan University to view cherry blossoms because one of them was wearing a kimono. An altercation ensued, leading to the students being pinned to the ground by security. Local police commented, quote, Wuhan University is a top-tier institution in China, and it's inappropriate to wear such attire for cherry blossom viewing. The guards were right in stopping them. On May 13, 2023, comedian Li Hao Shi, stage name House, who works under the banner of China's Xiaoguo Culture Company, mentioned during a stand-up performance that he adopted two stray dogs. Their behavior while chasing squirrels reminded him of the Chinese phrase, good work style, capable of winning battles. Li Hao Shi never anticipated that such a casual comment would land both him and his company in hot water. That evening, an anonymous user on Weibo highlighted his remarks because it is actually a slogan President Xi Jinping uses for the Chinese military. This caused a media frenzy. On May 17th, Xiaoguo Culture issued a statement acknowledging the inappropriate analogy made during the performance. The company suspended Li and indefinitely suspended his future work. Despite Li's public apology, his Weibo account faced a temporary ban. On May 17th, Beijing's Bureau of Culture and Tourism released a notice stating that the performance had a negative societal impact. The Bureau decided to fine Xiaoguo culture more than 13.35 million yuan, more than 1.8 million US dollars, and indefinitely halted all performances in Beijing. In the same day, the Shanghai Bureau of Culture and Tourism summoned and admonished the heads of Xiaoguo culture, demanding a suspension of all performances in Shanghai. Xiaoguo Culture subsequently announced the termination of their contract with Li Haoshi, imposed penalties on company executives, suspended all in-person performances, and initiated comprehensive internal rectification. The incident mirrors a frequent concept used in CCP propaganda, quote, hurting the feelings of the Chinese people. This phrase first appeared in the People's Daily in 1959 to criticize India over border disputes. Over the decades, the phrase has been used against governments, international organizations, media, automotive manufacturers, jewelers, hotel chains, and even athletes, corporate executives, actors, and musicians.
David Bandersky from the University of Hong Kong's China Media Project analyzed articles in the People's Daily from 1959 to 2015 and found 143 mentions of hurting the feelings of the Chinese people. Japan was the most accused nation at 51 times, followed by the U.S. at 35 times. Taiwan-related events were mentioned 28 times, followed by Tibet at 12 times. The Academia Sinica of Taiwan, based on the database of People's Daily, found that from 1949 to 2013, the term "hurting the feelings of the Chinese people" appeared a total of 319 times in the People's Daily. Recent examples include Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen's meeting with U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy during her visit in Los Angeles in April. The Chinese consulate spokesperson in Los Angeles criticized the meeting, stating it quote, "deeply hurt the feelings of the Chinese people." Miles Yu, former policy advisor to the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, pointed out that few believe such statements as "hurting the feelings of 1.4 billion Chinese" and that it's merely the CCP's bravado. Currently, the Chinese government is amending its laws, preparing to formally incorporate quote, "hurting the feelings of the Chinese nation" into national legislation to punish those who engage in such behavior. On June 29th, Premier Li Chang chaired a state council executive meeting where they discussed and approved the Public Security Administration punishments law. The draft has been reviewed and announced by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress and is open for public feedback. This revision touches on a wide range of issues, from insulting martyrs and pyramid schemes to exam cheating and drone flights. The most controversial are provisions against actions and symbols quote harming the spirit of the Chinese nation or hurting its feelings. Wearing or displaying symbols in public places that quote damage the spirit of the Chinese nation or hurt the feelings of the Chinese people, as well as quote producing, disseminating, promoting, or distributing items or statements that harm the spirit of the Chinese nation or hurt its feelings, could result in a detention of five to ten days or a fine ranging from one thousand to three thousand yuan. In severe cases, the penalty could escalate to a ten or fifteen day detention, coupled with a fine of up to five thousand yuan. Since the National People's Congress website published the draft of the Public Security Administration punishments law on September 5th, mainstream Chinese media have remained conspicuously silent on the matter. In contrast, the public has been vocal. Numerous netizens have already submitted over a hundred thousand opinions on the NPC website, and the topic has ignited fervent discussions on China's social media platform Weibo. One primary concern is the lack of clear definition in the draft for the terms "quote damage the spirit of the Chinese nation" and "hurt the feelings of the Chinese people." Some even asked Baidu's AI chatbot Wen Xingyi Yan what it means. The chatbot responded that it didn't know and suggested changing the topic. Numerous legal experts and netizens are questioning if this could evolve into a new form of "quote pocket crime." The term "pocket crime," as the name implies, refers to vaguely defined crimes in the legal framework that are so broad that they can encompass almost anything. Such crimes are commonly seen in authoritarian states and are frequently abused by those in power to suppress dissent and restrict citizens' rights. Professor Lao Dongyan of Tsinghua University's law school voiced her concerns on Weibo, stating that the concept of hurting the feelings of the Chinese people is highly ambiguous and could lead to the arbitrary expansion of administrative penalties, potentially exacerbating tensions between police and the public. Lao pointed out that matters of national spirit and feelings are cultural and should be promoted by the state, but not enforced by law. She warned that such measures could fuel populism and extreme nationalism, further deteriorating the public discourse and even posing challenges for China's foreign relations. Prominent ex-user Teacher Li is not your teacher voiced concerns about the expanded powers this grants to Chinese police. Theoretically, enjoying Japanese food, wearing Japanese brands, cosplaying Japanese characters, expressing different opinions on nuclear wastewater, or engaging in Western cultural activities might all be perceived as quote hurting Chinese feelings. In August 2023, security personnel hindered spectators wearing rainbow-themed attire from attending a concert in in Beijing by Taiwanese singer Zhang Huimei, aiming to curb the display of LGBTQ+ pride culture. Similarly, in that same month, mainland Chinese citizens reported a concert by Taiwanese singer Jo Lin Tsai, where her fans displayed rainbow lights. Some male fans even wore flamboyantly f- feminine outfits. Ironically, as the draft law is currently in the public consultation stage, two notifications that have been leaked online reveal that China's judicial departments have explicitly demanded that lawyers remain silent about the revisions. One notice is reportedly from the Judicial Bureau, and the other from Shanxi Province Department, both conveying the same message. 
quote, law firms and all lawyers shall not arbitrarily comment on the revisions of laws and regulations. In an interview with foreign media, a lawyer from mainland China referred to as Lawyer Wu candidly criticized the absurdity of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, saying, quote, the draft is out for public opinion. Lawyers and legal professionals are ideally suited to provide feedback. He emphasized that the public security law impacts the entire society, thus lawyers' insights are especially valuable. Another anonymous mainland lawyer stated, quote, the so-called rule of law by the CCP has been notably regressing in recent years. Legal reforms and amendments have become steps backward, stripping rights at every turn. It's all about empowering officialdom at the expense of civilian rights. Mr. Lee, a former deputy chief of a police station, believes that while the government must anticipate public backlash when revising such regulations, this particular law will soon be approved by the National People's Congress, suggesting that public consultation is merely a formality. Concerned netizens commented, quote, The real fear lies in the unchecked expansion of public authority at the expense of individual rights. As discussions gained momentum, Chinese netizens brought up a 1935 Nazi Germany law that stated, quote, Acts against the healthy feelings of the people, Gesundes Volksempfinden, shall be punished. The ambiguous nature of healthy feelings granted the Nazi judicial body tremendous discretionary power, leading to countless prosecutions and arrests. Netizens exclaimed, this reveals the true colors, and dictatorial regimes always follow a similar playbook. In 2021, a song titled Glass Heart, composed by Malaysian Chinese artist Na Miwi, went viral online, amassing nearly 70 million views on YouTube. With its upbeat rhythm, it used romance to metaphorically critique the CCP's hypersensitivity, addressing widespread sentiments, which garnered widespread acclaim. Consequently, the stars in the music video were banned from all audiovisual platforms in mainland China. The concept of hurting the feelings of the Chinese nation is not the first pocket crime introduced since the establishment of the CCP. From 1997 onward, quote, picking quarrels and provoking troubles has been considered one of China's typical pocket crimes. As described in the criminal law of the People's Republic of China, violators can be sentenced to up to five years in prison. Because the terminology is vague, all-encompassing, and has a high threshold for criminality, it has become a tool for the CCP government and police to handle petitioners and group protests. Many online commentators have been convicted under this name in recent years. Simply put, if the CCP dislikes someone, they can be conveniently charged. It's worth noting that the behaviors penalized by picking quarrels and provoking troubles are already addressed in the Public Security Administration Punishments Law. Thus, its continued existence serves more to stabilize the CCP regime. Data from China's Judgments Online reveals a significant increase in cases related to this crime, from 892 cases in 2011 to over 43,000 cases in 2019, a 49-fold increase. This crime now accounts for over 5% of all criminal cases, ranking it among the top 10 most common offenses. One notable example is Zhang Zhan, a master's graduate from Fudan University. In September 2019, while holding an umbrella inscribed with End Socialism, CCP Stepped Down, in support of Hong Kong's anti-extradition protests, she was detained for two months for picking quarrels and provoking troubles. After her release, in an interview, Zhang said, The problem with this country is institutional. We should bravely persist. Freedom is never free. I hope this country changes. In February 2022, following the outbreak of the coronavirus in Wuhan, the CCP concealed the truth about the epidemic. Zhang Zhan traveled to Wuhan to conduct on-the-ground interviews and posted numerous videos on Twitter and YouTube, offering the world a glimpse into the real situation in Wuhan. On May 14, 2020, Zhang was arrested in Wuhan by Shanghai police, and the next day she was criminally detained on charges of picking quarrels and provoking troubles, eventually serving a four-year prison sentence. Currently, Zhang is serving her sentence in a Shanghai women's prison. In December 2020, defense lawyers stated that Zhang began a hunger strike in late June and has been subjected to force feeding through a tube, shackling, and being forced to wear restraints 24-7, describing her treatment as torture. During a meeting with her lawyers, Zhang couldn't hold back her tears and remarked that, quote, every day is agony. In an interview, her lawyer mentioned that it's possible she might not survive to see the world beyond the prison walls. Article 35 of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China states that its citizens have the freedom of speech, 
press assembly, association, procession, and demonstration. In reality, these rights are often just a play on words under the CCP regime. In communist China, not only are applications for protests and assemblies rarely approved, but applicants also risk detention. On April 16, 2018, Wang Jian, a rights activist from Nanjing, submitted an application to the Public Security Departments for a May Day march protesting against the U.S.-initiated trade war. He was detained by the police the next afternoon. The next day, the police searched his house, and the search warrant accused him of picking quarrels and provoking troubles. His son's computer and mobile phone were confiscated. Friends familiar with Wang Jian said he committed no illegal acts. His application to march was according to national law and standard procedures. His sudden arrest left them stunned. Prior to 1997, a common pocket crime in China was counter-revolutionary activities. It was a vague catch-all charge, often leading to severe punishment. In the early days of CCP rule, many were executed merely for being landlords. During the Cultural Revolution, some were labeled counter-revolutionaries simply for accidentally sitting on a newspaper bearing Chairman Mao's portrait. In the early 1950s, the CCP's anti-counter-revolutionary campaigns arrested over 2.62 million individuals, executing more than 712,000. According to internal investigations cited by Struggle Magazine, over 135,000 individuals were sentenced to death during the Cultural Revolution for being active counter-revolutionaries. In 1997, the criminal law of the People's Republic of China replaced the charge of counter-revolutionary activities with endangering national security. In all communist countries, the highest authority isn't the law, the will of the people, or even the truth. It's the will of the party. The party monopolizes all power and doesn't tolerate questioning or challenges. The existence of pocket crimes serves to instill fear in the populace. In contrast to rule of law nations, where, aside from actions explicitly outlawed, everything is permissible, under the CCP's logic, only what the party allows is permissible. The law becomes merely a facade for the party. This is why, under CCP rule, there are countless red lines and sensitivities that the average person finds puzzling. Fundamentally, they challenge the CCP's authority. In 2022, former U.S. Secretary of State. Mike Pompeo spoke directly to the Chinese people. There is no bigger enemy for the CCP than you, the Chinese people. He said, "I know this is true because all my interactions with the CCP leaders convinced me that what the CCP truly cares about is maintaining their stranglehold over the Chinese people." If a day arrives when the people of China are no longer afraid of the CCP and dare to oppose it, that will truly be the party's greatest fear.